Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Colin McLeod. Um, I've been invited to this year's UK Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival down here in St Maws uh, to give advice on, on mullet. Uh, I started off fly fishing for trout. I spent uh, many years doing that, but when I moved to the south of England, then um, it was really the sea that caught my attention and, and uh, the wild fish that inhabit it. I uh, started off fishing for bass, as most people do. Um, catching small bass for several years, but after a while you, um, you, you look for something larger. Um, and that's why I, I turned my attention to mullet. Plenty large mullet around, but uh, the problem is how to catch them. Uh, so I, I took up the challenge. Uh, very little information available when I first started on the internet or in magazines. Um, so it was, it was really a, a suck it and see type situation. Um, the first mullet ever caught was on a flexi-floss bloodworm, uh, which is pretty much a, a trout fly. And uh, I caught that on my very first cast. And from that point on, I was, I was really quite hooked, every bit as hooked as, as a mullet were. It took me probably another five months to land my second mullet. And that gives an indication of just how tricky they are to, to bring to the net. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked by Fly Fish and Fly Time magazine uh, to write a, a monthly saltwater column and that gave me the opportunity and impetus then to um, experiment and spend quite a lot of time fishing. Luckily there was a mullet hotspot uh, within a mile or two of my home so I was able to visit regularly and uh, get, get the practice in. Um, so how do you catch a mullet? The, the first step is to locate fish. If you can find uh, a location with a, a good population of mullet there then you're, you're, you're well on the road. Uh, the approach to, to mullet depends on the type of mullet you've found. The most common mullet are thick lip mullet. Uh, they are likely to be found around the mouths of rivers and estuaries uh, and typically they feed on the incoming tide uh, in the current cr uh, created by the river as it runs into the sea. So the tactic for them is very, very simple. It's uh, a dead drift technique, which simply means that you use a floating line and you, you present the flies up current from the mullet and let them just drift in the current towards the fish, keeping the fly line tight. Look at the end of the fly line and if you see any movement or the, or the, the fly line stops, then give a gentle strip strike to set the hook. Don't lift the rod as you would for a trout because you won't set the hook. The, the, the mullet has a very tough upper lip and the hook won't penetrate it and after the first run you will you'll lose your fish almost certainly. Um, so they're drifting towards uh, an approaching shoal as, as simple as that. The flies that we would use, good drifting flies are, are dye bass. The dye bass is a very traditional trout pattern. Uh, the difference about this fly is that it has uh, blue peacock feather as a tail and it's got two red glass beads to form the head. That's what really sets it apart and for some reason the, the mullet take that fly very very readily indeed. If you have a shoal of feeding thick lips and you drift these fly, flies towards them it's almost certain that they will, they will take the fly. Um, the Ghostbuster is another, another very useful fly. It's uh, it has a foam body so it will float high in the water and if the fish are feeding in very shallow water as they tend to do in any case that's a fly. So if, if they're feeding in six inches of water or less a ghostbuster is a good fly because it just drifts over any weed and stones and avoids getting snagged. Um, the spectra shrimp, that's a, a fly that I created a couple of years ago. Um, it's a very bright blingy fly and I was a little bit concerned to begin with that it might scare the fish rather than attract them but uh, the, fir the first time I, I gave it a swim it was it had instant success and it's one of the few flies that if you pull it in front of feeding mullet they'll actually chase after it and take the fly so it's very useful in that respect. Another fly that mullet will chase is a red tag again it's a, a very traditional fly from the, the 18th century um, and they will chase that as well. Uh, so, so these are two of the very few flies that the mullet will chase. Uh, you need to retrieve the flies in front of mullet that are feeding in still water where there's no current. So ideally it's dead drift the flies towards them in the absence of a current, um, then a very slow retrieve with a spectra shrimp, red tag or, or even a dieback, that's, that's a good fly as well. 
The second most type, uh, common type of mullet are the thin lip mullet. Uh, their preferred habitat is feeding over mud banks on the flooding tide. Um, and also, uh, they're found well up rivers, tidal rivers that in Sussex, for instance, you'll, you'll find them six miles upstream even more. Uh, so they're, they're quite happy to, to uh, be in an environment where there's more than just a drop of fresh water. In fact, the fresh water seems to attract them. Uh, when they feed over mud, it's a very simple approach again as well. Uh, you just find an area where thin lips come in on the, the flooding tide, and as the water comes over the, the mud flats, the fish will rush in to eat um, shrimps called mud shrimps, so they're, they're Latin name is Carofim volutator. Uh, so the, the, there's a very limited period of time for the, the, the mullet to, to claim these shrimps before they return to the, the safety of their underground burrows. So that's why you'll see thin lip mullet uh, with their backs out of the water really rushing into shallow wa water to, to grab these, these shrimps before they escape to their burrows. Um, so that there's two flies to imitate the mud shrimps. Uh, one is the flexi shrimp. Uh, obviously brown and that's because shrimps in that sort of environment tend to be brown. Um, and the other fly is imaginatively called a mud shrimp um, or Carophium volutator is, is the Latin name. Uh, the approach for these fish as they're feeding on the shrimp in the very shallow water is to, to stand in slightly deeper water. You've got to be careful when mud's involved, you know, don't go in a soft area. Safety, safety first, but where, um, where there's mud banks there tends to be areas of gravel between them where the water scours through and you can stand on those quite safely. So, so that gives a good vantage point behind the fish. You can see them um, as, as they progress over the mud hunting down the shrimp. Simply a case of drop the flies where the fish are feeding in amongst them, let them settle for a few seconds and then a few quick strips is usually all it takes. The problem then of course is that uh, You've got anchor ropes and chains where, where, where yachts are present because they're te they, they tend to feed around yachts uh, where, where on, on mud banks. So you have to be, be, be ready for the first run for the nearest anchor rope or chain. So it makes it very exciting to hold the fish back and see it jump and uh, they give a good fight. Thin lips tend to be in the two to three pound range in that sort of environment. Um, up rivers, uh, I had first, my first experience of that a few weeks ago. Um, somebody contacted me to say that they'd found shoals of thin lips well up upriver, but they, they were having difficulty catching them. Uh, so we, we met up and tried with the, the normal tra tactics of um, dye bass and spectra shrimps, but uh, we got no response at all, even though there were, there were quite good, good shoals present. Uh, we then hatched a plan based on a technique to catch thin lip mullet using MEPS spinners tipped off with uh, ragworm. Uh, and the flexi worm um, has accounted for many mullet uh, for myself over the years and I've, it's been suggested to me by quite a few people that that represents a ragworm or harbour, harbour rag it's called specifically which is a small red ragworm. Uh, so we popped one of those on the point fly and uh, next cast we had interest straight away uh, and a few casts later a fish came in and took a dye back that was on the dropper so it's almost as if the flexi worm acted as a, an attractor in, in some ways. Uh, they, they started to pull at the flexi fl floss legs as well uh, which was quite annoying but uh, yeah so we managed to get success and that, that's, that's a technique that now seems to work. The third type of uh, mullet that's uh, available to us in, in the UK is the golden grey mullet. They tend to be found on sandy beaches, mainly in the south of the country, south coast of England, uh, Cornwall, Devon, South Wales is a real hot spot. Um, Hampshire and Sussex, we don't have sand, sandy beaches there to any great extent, but even a small sandy bay, 30 metres wide, they will come and feed there because sand is what, is what they look for. The best te technique for catching golden greys is to enter the water behind the shoal. Again, they will feed on the advancing tide, right on the edge of the tide. Um, as, as the waves break over the sand, they're just behind because the sand stirs up food and they're ready to pounce. So the, the angler takes up position behind the golden greys, maybe 15 yards behind. Probably the best fly in that situation again is the flexiworm. Um, because, as I've explained, it's taken as, as some kind of marine worm. Um, that's a very good technique. If it's not working or if there's insufficient waves to generate 
food for them, then they will simply patrol on the, on the flood and tide maybe for an hour or so until they eventually find food and then, then they'll start to feed um, quite fervently. Uh, in, that, in that situation, the dieback that we looked at earlier is, is a good fly. Uh, and the spectral shrimp as well. In other words, you're starting to pull them slowly in front of the fish rather than allowing the, the worm fly to just roll around in the wash and be discovered by the, by the golden grey. So that, that's the three environments that you'll uh, traditionally find these fish in um, and the, the techniques to catch them. Uh, th there's been some advancements in the, in the last year or so uh, that's produced some really exciting fishing uh, and, and under quite different circumstances. One was on a surf beach in Wales, um, typical golden grey type surf beach, but the difference with, with this surf beach is that um, all three species of mullet can be caught there at the same time. And the reason for that is the presence of an algae, um, which forms as, as the water warms up. Um, algae is common all around the British Isles, uh, the North Sea, you know, so lots of European coasts have it as well. Um, it's, it's usually seen as white foam, but once it blooms, uh, algae blooms like a, like a flower. After, after it does it, it, it dies. And once it dies, it turns brown. And the brown decaying algae is deposited on the sand. Um, and it's very easy to see the areas where the algae has been deposited. As you walk down the beach, and, and then these beaches tend to be three miles long or, or more, you know, beautiful long surf beaches, you'll see pristine white breakers crashing onto the, the beach. And every 100 yards or so, you'll see a 20 yard wide strip of brown water. And that brown water is caused by the presence of the algae. And wherever you find the algae in the water, then you'll find fish without a doubt. And it can be either any of the three species. It just depends um, on which shore we come across. So you have a <clears throat> very good chance of a grand slam, a mullet grand slam uh, in, a, in a situation like that. So that, that's been tremendous fishing. Um, We've tried and failed to produce uh, an algae fly, a fly that looks like a bit of the algae. Typically it's, it's um, probably the size of a 10 pence piece. It's brown and bubbly, a bit like the inside of an aero bar. Uh, and it float, floats on the water as, as the tide comes in. Uh, it picks it up and uh, the fish follow and eat on it. So the, you, you'll, you'll see thousands of fish basically 20 yards from shore eating on this algae. But, if, if you spent all day covering them with flies and slowly stripping them through, you, you'd probably catch one or two, uh, maybe miss a few more. And it, it's wonderfully exciting as well, uh, very visual. But the, the most um, effective technique has been discovered by a Welsh, a Welsh guy called Darren Jackson. And he ignores the fish that are 20 yards offshore. And instead, he targets fish that are within a few feet of the edge of the water in, in water that's probably six inches deep. Um, as, as the surf pushes in the waves, the, you, you get these water tables forming, which are maybe 20 yards wide, 30 yards wide, six inches deep or so. And in there, often concealed, are, are good numbers of, of decent fish. Um, the first time most fishers realize they're there is as they walk in the water and, and spook them and they just go shooting off into the, the surf. So Darren came up with the technique of uh, ignoring the fish further out, looking along the wash for little groups of fish feeding on shrimps rather than the algae. Uh, and he'll creep along often on his hands and knees for the last few yards uh, to take up position. And as, 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 the, as the water rushes out and leaves dry sand, the fish go with it. They will then come back in with it within seconds as a new wave forms and a new table pushes up. Uh, and then you, you need to be in position waiting for, for the fish to come back in on the table. Uh, and then it's sight fishing from that point of view. You can see which way they're moving uh, and you just drop the flies in front of them. The flies uh, which are really successful there, again, are the spectral shrimp. And um, the, the, the ghost buster, that's, that's good in the very shallow water, they'll, they'll take a ghost buster as well. Um, and the dieback. The, the dieback is practically the same as, as this one here, but we put a sparkly tail on. Instead of a feather tail, we put a, a bit of crystal flash on and give it a rib of crystal flash as well. And that seems to make a difference in these, con in these conditions. Uh, the fish will take a, a sparkly die back more readily than, than the, the normal red-headed one. Um, the other fly that we've uh, had some success with is the Romy's shrimp. Um, I created that one during the winter. 
specifically for this, this festival to fish over sand for golden greys. Uh, I, I trialled it in Spain in June and uh, it caught mullet straight away, so it's, it's done well. And it's, and it's caught fish on the surf beach in Wales as, as well. So, uh, so the, the message really about the surf beaches, we have sandy surf beaches in, in many areas of the UK and if we have this algae forming, uh, I've done some research and apparently it's very widespread. Um, and if there's mullet in the area as well, then the chances are that where you find the algae, you, you'll find mullet. The really interesting thing about the algae is that it's, it's a very common algal bloom. Uh, while it's living, it uh, appears as white foam and it's actually toxic to the fish and marine, marine life at that point in time. But once it blooms, when, it, when algae blooms, it's, it's like a, a massive uh, cell division, um, at which point it then dies. Once it dies, it turns brown uh, and decays. And as soon as it's decaying, it releases carbohydrates and sugars such as polysaccharides. So the algae in its brown form is, is basically an energy drink and that's why the fish go looking for it. And, and these fish, as a result of um, feeding on this energy drink day in, day out throughout, throughout the summer, are wonderfully fit, large specimens of fish and put up a, a fantastic fight. So that's really worthwhile checking out. And that fishing is probably the most exciting fishing I've experienced um, ever. It's, it's, it's that good. Um, I'm often asked about the, the sort of equipment to use um, and I, like the tactics we use, it's very straightforward and, and simple. Uh, normal trout rods, uh, preferably five weights, six weights are, are ideal uh, and it's always a floating line that we use because the shoals are always encountered in shallow water so you need a floating line, especially when you want the flies to drift in the current, a floating line aids that. Um, if the line passes over a shoal of fish, it, it doesn't disturb them or spook them in any way and they'll, they'll simply sw swim under it. If it was an intermediate line, they, they'd probably be touching the line and may become spooked, so floating line. Um, the, the, you do get salt water specific outfits. Um, many companies now produce six weight rods. Uh, but I, if it, a five weight, at this point in time, you, you'll have to use a fresh water rod or a river rod. Um, a grey stream flex five weight is, is perfect, um, quite sensitive. And the advantage of using a five or six weight outfit is, as well is when the fish are feeding in very shallow water, uh, you, you want the, the impact of the fly line landing to be as delicate as, as, as possible. If you use a nine weight, as uh, many saltwater fishers do, then it's got all the delicacy of a felled tree uh, falling on the water in front of them, and it will certainly spook them. So, so go light, that's, that's the best way. The leaders I use tend to be 12 feet long, uh, and I like to use one dropper about three, three feet up from the point to keep the flies quite close together. Um, I used to fish with two droppers, but found that I rarely if ever caught, caught a, f a fish on the top dropper. Uh, and if conditions are windy, then it's more prone to tangling. So, so one dropper's a, a good idea. Um, I, I just tie the leaders straight through, no, no tapered leaders. The small flies, uh, th these flies are size 12, so they're very easy to, to turn over. Um, you, you're, you tend to be creeping up on the, on the mullet, so there's no long distance casts involved. So if you're not the greatest caster in the world, then mullet fishing's probably, probably for you. Uh, leader fluorocarbon I prefer myself for several reasons. Um, one, one is the fact that it's practically invisible in, in water and less likely to spook the fish. Mullet have some of the best eyesight of, of any fish that swims, so you don't want to see the leader. Uh, the other thing is that salt water is more buoyant than fresh water. So uh, the fact that fluorocarbon is heavier than nylon or copolymer and sinks more quickly, um, that's in your favour as well. You don't want to see the leader curled up on the surface, catching the sunlight, because that really will spook the fish. Really, that's, that's it. Very simple. The, the tactics sound simple because they are. The, the most important thing is to find shoals and find shoals that are feeding. When, when they're feeding, um, you'll see they suddenly become animated, they'll swim quickly, they'll splash and swirl, turn on their sides and give silver flashes. That's an indication that they're turning to, to pick up food. So when you see that, that's the time to, to get your flies in amongst them and uh, you, you will almost certainly hook up. Good luck.